but if they had been twice as many, ah, four times, old Fezziwig would have been a match for them, and so would Mrs. Fezziwig. As to her, she was worthy to be his partner in every sense of the term. If that's not high praise, tell me higher and I'll use it. A positive light appeared to issue from the Fezziwig's calves. They shone in every part of the dance like moons. You couldn't have predicted at any given time what would have become of them next. An old Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig had gone all through the dance. Advance and retire, both hands to your partner, bow and curtsy, corkscrew, thread the needle, back again to your place. Fezziwig cut cut so deftly that he appeared to wink with his legs and came upon his feet again without a stagger. When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up. Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig took their stations, one on either side of the door, and shaking hands with every person individually, as he or she went out, wished him or her a Merry Christmas. When everyone had retired but the two apprentices, they did the same to them, and thus the cheerful voices died away, the lads were left to their beds, which were under a counter in the back shop. During the whole of this time, Scrooge had acted like a man out of his wits. His heart and soul were in the scene and with his former self. He corroborated everything, remembered everything, enjoyed everything, and underwent the strangest agitation. It was not until now, when the bright faces of his former self and Dick were turned from them, and he remembered the ghosts and became conscious that it was looking full upon him while the light upon its head burnt very clear. "'A small matter,' said the ghost, "'to make these silly folks so full of gratitude.' "'Small!' echoed Scrooge. The spirit signed to him to listen to the two apprentices who were pouring out their hearts in praise of Fezziwig. When he had done so, said, "'Why, is it not? He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money,' Three or four, perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves this praise? It isn't that, said Scrooge, heated by the remark, and speaking unconsciously like his former, not his latter self. It isn't that, spirit. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. Say that his power lies in words and looks, and things so slight and insignificant, that it is impossible to add and count them up. What then? The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. He felt the spirit's glance and stopped. What is the matter? said the ghost. Nothing particular, said Scrooge. Something, I think, the ghost insisted. No, said Scrooge. No, I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That's all. His former self turned down the lamps as he gave utterance to the wish, and Scrooge and the ghost stood side by side in the open air. "'My time grows short,' observed the spirit. "'Quick!' This was not addressed to Scrooge or to anyone whom he could see, but produced an immediate effect, for again Scrooge saw himself. He was older now, a man in the prime of life. His face had not the harsh and rigid lines of latter years, but had begun to wear the signs and care of avarice." There was an eager, greedy, restless motion in the eye, which showed the passion that had taken root, and where the shadow of the growing tree would fall. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in a mourning dress, in whose eyes there were tears which sparkled in the light that shone out of the ghost of Christmas past. "'It matters little,' she said softly. "'To you, very little. Another idol has displaced me. If I could cheer and comfort you in time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you, he rejoined. A golden one. This is the even-handed dealing of the world, he said. There is nothing on which it is so hard as poverty. There is nothing it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. You fear the world too much, she answered gently. All your other hopes have merged into the hope of being beyond the chance of its sordid reproach. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion gain engrosses you. Have I not? What then? he retorted. Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? I am not changed towards you. She shook her head. Am I? Our contract is an old one. 
It was made when we were both poor and content to be so, until in good season we could improve our worldly fortune by our patient industry. You are changed. When it was made, you were another man. I was a boy, he said impatiently. Your own feeling tells you that you are not what you are, she returned. I am. That which promised happiness when we were one in heart is fraught with misery now that we are two. How often and how keenly I have thought of this I will not say. It is enough that I have thought of it and can release you. Have I ever sought release? In words? No, never. In what, then? In a changed nature. In an altered spirit. In another atmosphere of life. Another hope as its great end. And everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. This had never been between us, said the girl, looking mildly, but with steadiness upon him. Tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? Ha! <sighs> no. He seemed to yield to the justice of this supposition in spite of himself. But he said with a struggle, You think not? I would gladly think otherwise if I could, she answered. Heaven knows. When I have learned a truth like this, I know how strong and irresistible it must be. But if you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl, you who, in your very confidence with her, weigh everything by gain, or choosing her if for a moment you were false enough to your one guiding principle to do so? Do I not know that your repentance and regret would surely follow? I do, and I release you with a full heart for the love of him you once were. He was about to speak, but her head turned from him. She resumed. You may, memory of what has passed have, makes me hope you will, have pain in this. Very, very brief time. You will dismiss the recollection of it, gladly, as an unprofitable dream from which it happened well that you awoke. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. She left him. And they parted. Spirit, said Scrooge, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you delight to torment me? One shadow more, exclaimed the ghost. No more, cried Scrooge, no more. I don't wish to see it. Show me no more. But the relentless ghost pinioned him in both his arms and forced him to observe what happened next. They were in another scene and place, a room not very large or handsome, but full of comfort. Near to the winter fire sat a beautiful young girl, so like that last the Scrooge believed it was the same until he saw her, now a comely matron sitting opposite her daughter. The noise in this room was perfectly tumultuous, for there were more children there than Scrooge in his agitated state of mind could count. And unlike the celebrated herd in the poem, there were not forty children conducting themselves like one, but every child was conducting itself like forty. The consequences were uproarious beyond belief, but no one seemed to care. On the contrary, the mother and daughter laughed heartily and enjoyed it very much. The latter, soon beginning to mingle in the sports, got pillaged by the young brigands most ruthlessly. What would I not have given to be one of them? Oh, I never could have been so rude. No, no. I wouldn't, for the wealth of all the world, have crushed that braided hair and torn it down, and for the precious little shoe I wouldn't have plucked it off, God bless my soul, to save my life. As to measuring her waist in sport, as they did, bold young brood, I couldn't have done it. I should have expected my arm to have grown round it for a punishment, and never come straight again. And yet I should have dearly liked, I own, to have touched her lips, to have questioned her, that she might have opened them, to have looked upon the lashes for downcast eyes and never raised a blush, to have let loose waves of hair, an inch of which would be a keepsake beyond price. Short, I would have liked, I do confess, to have had the lightest license of a child, yet to have been man enough to know its value. But now a knocky at the door was heard, and such a rush immediately ensued that she was with laughing face and plundered dress was borne toward it in the center of a flushed and boisterous group just in time to greet the father who came home attended by a man laden with Christmas toys and presents. Then the shouting and the struggling and the onslaught that was made on the defenseless porter, 
the scaling him with chairs for ladders, to dive into his pockets, to spoil him of brown paper parcels, hold on tight by his cravat, hug him around his neck, pawn all his back, and kick his legs in irrepressible affection. The shouts of wonder and delight with which the development of every package was received, the terrible announcement that the baby had been taken in the act of putting a doll's frying pan into his mouth, was more than suspected of having swallowed a fictitious turkey glued on a wooden platter. The immense relief of finding this a false alarm, the joy and gratitude and ecstasy, they're all indescribable alike. It is enough that by degrees the children and their emotions got out of the parlor, and by one stair at a time up to the top of the house, where they went to bed and so subsided. And now Scrooge looked on more attentively than ever, when the master of the house, having his daughter leaning fondly on him, sat down with her and her mother at his own fireside. When he thought that such another creature, quite as graceful and as full of promise, might have called him father, and been a springtime in the haggard winter of his life, his sight grew very dim indeed. Bell, said the husband, turning to his wife with a smile, I saw an old friend of yours this afternoon. Who was it? Guess. How can I? Don't I know, she added in the same breath, laughing as he laughed. Mr. Scrooge. Mr. Scrooge it was, past his office window, and as it was not shut up and he had a candle inside, I could scarcely help seeing him. His partner lies upon the port of death, I hear, and there he sat alone, quite alone in the world, I do believe. Spirit, said Scrooge in a broken voice, remove me from this place. I told you there were shadows of the things that have been, said the ghost. That they are what they are, do not blame me. Remove me, Scrooge exclaimed. I cannot bear it. He turned upon the ghost, and seeing that it looked upon him with a face, in which in some strange way there were fragments of all the faces that had shown him, wrestled with it. Leave me! Take me back! Haunt me no longer! In the struggle, if that can be called a struggle, in which the ghost with no visible resistance on his own part was undisturbed by any effort of his adversary, Scrooge observed that its light was burning high and bright, and dimly connecting that with its influence over him. He seized the extinguisher cap, and by a sudden action pressed it down upon its head. The spirit dropped beneath it so that the extinguisher covered its whole form, but though Scrooge pressed it down with all his force, he could not hide the light which streamed from under it in an unbroken flood upon the ground. He was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, and further of being in his own bedroom. He gave the cap a parting squeeze, in which his hand relaxed, had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. <laughs>